Without further ado, here's Susan. Thanks, Adam. I'll pin this on really quick so hopefully you can hear me and in case I pace because I told myself I wasn't going to be intimidated, but now I realize that I'm in a room full of historians. So um, feel free to jump in anytime. As Adam said, it is hospital week, and that also co coincides with another historical event because Florence Nightingale's birthday is May 12th. And so we celebrate hospital week and nurses week always around the week that involves May 12th. So you'll see from my screen um, that Spencer Hospital was established in 1914. And I was visiting with Mr. Schaefer a little bit before, and there were actually several community um, uh, privately operated hospitals before 1914. This is the original, um, what we consider the original Spencer Hospital, which was a community not-for-profit hospital. And as such, we celebrate our, our centennial, not sesquicentennial, um, in 2014. So I learned a lot of history then, but actually ran across some information when I was preparing for tonight, and I learned a little bit more. So I'm going to go through a few decades. I'll try not to drag out the whole 109-year history of the hospital, but I do kind of concentrate a little bit in the 20s and 30s about some really fun stuff, at least what I think is fun stuff. So. Um, in the beginning, we know Clay County was established in the mid-1850s, and Spencer was platted in 1871. I, we know we celebrate our sesquicentennial last year, and I have Bob Rose for helping me remember that. Highways 18 and 71 go through Spencer, so that's a good way to remember 1871. Um, at that time, there were, this area grew rapidly in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and there were medical professionals in the community. However, a lot of those were going out making house calls. A lot of times surgeries were actually performed in people's homes. There were private duty nurses that maybe came and stayed with somebody at their home, and of course we had mother's home remedies. So a few of our early physicians, I went online and I found a couple of biographies, and we have heard the name doc of Dr. McAllister before. You know, but what really impressed me was not only was he an active physician, he was an active, he owned lots of farmland, he was an active businessman responsible for the McAllister block in Spencer, and he was the president of three banks in Clay County, which I found really interesting, and very civically minded too, um, involved in several organizations, and particularly some of the fraternal organizations like the Lodge and Shrine and Odd Fellows. Then I found Dr. William Palmer Woodcock, who was trained in New York, and he worked as a physician in New York State for nearly 30 years, needed a break. He came out west, settled in Spencer, and according to the biography I found, he really took that first few years just to kind of rest and hunt and fish and all that, then went back to the medical practice. But his was, um, it was interesting as well that he also owned farmland and um, it was noted that he had rental properties. So he was also a businessman in the community. Um, that's where I found it was the biographies written by Samuel Glipsy and James Steele. And the name William Woodcock comes up again later too in my presentation. So the forerunner to Spencer Hospital, whoops, Sorry for the technical difficulties, I better not move too much was um, the Wayne Hospital. So Jasper Wayne was a businessman in town and he purchased the former Baptist Church on West Third Street. He converted it into a house. And then there was a headline in 1912 that he was going to convert that home into a hospital, which he did and it became the Wayne Hospital. And I've also heard of the Fettus Hospital, which was in one of the uh, second floor of one of the downtown businesses. And again, as we discussed, there was more than, there was a, down, a hospital down on West 7th Street, East 7th. East 7th Street as well, so. So then 1914 came around. And there was a headline in the newspaper that Jasper Wayne um, announced his intentions to get out of the hospital business, which maybe isn't always as easy as it looks. So um, the Spencer Hospital Association was formed. And the hospital association were 17 ladies representing area churches in town. Along with that and other community members and their spouses, they created the Spencer Hospital Holding Company. They did a lot of active fundraising and they also sold shares and um, held events and 
they were able to organize the first nonprofit community hospital in Spencer. So as such, the Articles for Incorporation were filed with the state in August of 1914. They acquired the building in September, and then they closed for some renovations. And as Adam knows that renovations sometimes take longer than you think, they opened again in January of 1915. So the first patient in 1915 is an interesting case. And we actually have, it's hard to see, but over on the side, this one, you see Emily Rora was admitted to the hospital. We also found this article, however, learned later because I met a relative of Emma. She went by Lee. Um, she was a little three-year-old girl. She was playing outside, caught her hand on it, had her hand on a rope, horse kind of startled, um, caught her hand in a pulley, and they ended up having to amputate four of her fingers on one of her hands. My assumption is that in January of 1915, since that happened in the summer, that there might have been a complication from that, perhaps an infection. I'm not quite sure on that. However, the second patient we have is inter another interesting case because when they opened the hospital, they decided they were gonna be devoted to medical and surgical patients. They weren't gonna do obstetrics. Babies were born at home. However, we had a determined mother because Mr. and Mrs. Jen Swenson, they live south of Spencer, it's about six miles, it said. They came in January, horses loaded up in a bobsled, a lot of blankets. She shows up at the hospital in labor. They invited her in and did their compassionate thing and helped her deliver a baby girl whom they named Esther. Mrs. Swanson had had five previous pregnancies and they had all resulted in either the babies being stillborn or they hadn't lived very long. So she had a successful baby who was the first baby at Spencer Hospital. Now, the other interesting part of this, here's a picture from a, a newspaper clipping. The Swanson family moved to Minnesota. Mrs. Swanson had another pregnancy. Baby did not survive. So out of sev seven pregnancies, baby Esther, the first baby born at Spencer Hospital, was the only survivor. Um, Esther married, and a man named Eugene Dallager moved back to Spencer and raised a family here. And so in the 90s, um, Miss A, Ruth Anderson, actually invited her to come to an auxiliary meeting and tell her story. And I think that's when the newspaper article was done as well. But before 1914 and the 1915 hospital happened, I ran across this great information that there was a case for a public hospital before then. Dr. E.E. E. Munger had got to thinking if there can be public schools, why can't there be a publicly supported hospital? So he got together with Representative Felt, who was a representative, state representative from the Spencer area, and they wrote a bill, took it down to the state house. Now, according to the article, it was a little controversial, but it did pass. So the hospital supporters rallied around, called for a petition to have a bond issue election. So they did that in 1910. The first vote was defeated four to one. So they rallied again, around again, they did some more work, and they had a second vote, but not until 1926. At that time, they were proposing a $100,000 bond. They had a $50,000 pledge for a donation, and I understand that was from Emmy Griffin, whose name we've heard before in our Spencer history. And they were doing $50,000 in, in fundraising and also public subscription. It passed in Spencer, it failed in the rest of the county, and it did not pass. So turned around, third time's a charm, maybe. Had a third, third vote in 1930. They downsized it to the $75,000 bond issue. I am not aware if they still had the donations in place or not. It also failed, though. It was a narrow margin, passed in Spencer, passed in a lot of the um, uh, different um, townships, but did not pass, did not win the majority vote. It was close, but no, no cigar, I should say. However, what Dr. Munger did, I was Googling to find out a little bit more about him, and I never did find much of his history. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. But I ended up on the Washington County Hospital page in Washington, Iowa, which is Southeast Iowa. That's kind of my home stomping grounds where I grew up. And they actually also voted in 1910. There were eight counties that voted to have a county hospital in 1910. At that time, Washington County was the only one who passed it. 
and they take they claim they were the not only the first rural county public hospital in Iowa but the first rural county hospital in the nation now I found this on not only on their page but another source that was in the Iowa Medical Society history which also claims the same thing and then in the very very lower corner which that is I know impossible to read Washington County Hospital had a plaque donated by the Munger family crediting Dr. Munger and the Munger Bill for making this happen. Um, in searching public hospitals, I did find, you know, Bellevue, Bellevue in New York was a public hospital. So I'm assuming the, the reference is more into rural hospitals in rural America. So we can take a lot of pride in um, what our forefathers did for the public hospital system. So three times down, defeated but not done. So here's the rest of the story. So in 1931, the Hospital Association decided to have a fund drive, and they actually found two gentlemen from Sioux Falls to help them raise money. Their plan was to raise $100,000, and they were going to do that through fundraising, but they were also selling hospital certificates. And if you bought a hospital certificate for $100, you were to later be able to redeem that for $100 worth of healthcare services. Well, we know what happened in 1931. Nationally, it was not a good time with the Depression. Spencer was recovering from the fire. A lot of investments in the community had to go into rebuilding after the fire. Um, ag prices were awful. So in 1932, they returned the money that they had raised. <laughs> then comes William Woodcock. And I looked up, um, Dr. Woodcock actually passed away in 1911. He had a son, William Woodcock Jr. William Woodcock Jr. was president of the Chamber of Commerce, very involved in the community. He proposed, what about a municipal hospital? So they went back to the legislature, and um, according to the article, it, no one voted against it. It voted into law um, with everyone voting in favor of it. The governor signed it. Spencer um, went together and had a vote. So on June 6, 1933, they voted to have a municipal hospital. Oh, and the, the provisions, uh, let me back up a little bit. The provisions of having a municipal hospital was you had to own your public utility, your power and light plant, plant had to be debt free, and then you could use up to 50% of the earnings towards constructing a hospital. So, we should be here where we're getting Spencer Hospital, or were we? What happened, the legislation actually, the resolution said may give the public funds, not shall. So it wasn't binding on the city council. So a week later, there was a gentleman in town, according to the article, his name was Woody Baston, filed an injunction saying that the city should not make that appropriation. Then there were rumors that he may change his mind. So a few days after that, another man, Dewey Grove, filed a second injunction. And so, nothing was done and then meanwhile the governor signs a proclamation that um, some federal money that they were getting from the state up to 30 percent of the hospital's cost could be used from this federal money but their hands were tied because the city council couldn't move forward with the appropriation because this was going to court so in february of um, 34 the settlement was reached and the injunction was dismissed so they launched into fundraising um, interesting thing and this is for the 35 hospital which is located where the hospital currently is today a gentleman named JT Painter donated the land um, RW Hansen offered a $10,000 matching grant so he said to the community for every dollar given I will give up to $10,000 and the community came through they supported it big time um, and the deal was it was to be managed by the Spencer Hospital Association, leased to the association for a dollar per year for a payment. So 30, 35, and this is the other part that amazes me. Construction began in August of 34, and the hospital opened in February of 35. So I am so impressed that they got this project done that quickly. Um, there was a huge open house. The hospital opened debt-free because they had 36,000 from the light plant fund and the rest was fundraised. Lots of headlines I found in the paper for the next week. The first one is really fun because it says 25 visitors came. They had a three-day open house. Um, 
Later articles I found where they said 5,000 people came. This is probably more accurate because this was the week after the open house. Um, although you never know about the exaggeration because if you read that first line, it says they will thrill at the sight of the shining luster of the beautiful terrazzo floors, which will gleam with the brilliance of the beautiful sunshine of the walls of the Taj Mahal. So a lot of um, description there that is really fun to read. The other fun part is a private room was $30 a week. And um, they were really proud with the fundraising because fundraising continued, you know, the Frigidaire was given. But the best little fundraising story is Dewey Grove, who had filed the injunction, was never against the hospital. He just didn't think there should have been a $60,000 appropriation. He just felt it should be less, and so it was, and it was the $36,000. So he gave groceries to the hospital and, and a fruit basket, too. So he got things started. In 1936, um, and I know I've seen this article before. I've been looking the last few weeks. I couldn't find it, but it was determined at that time that the hospital association shouldn't run it because those public funds were granted to get the 35 building built and started. So at that time, all the shares were released and a board of trustees was elected. Then in the 40s, there was a lot of growth in services. The nurse aid program was developed, their laboratory, x-ray services and all that. And I have to say that through the years, you know, um, like leading up to this point and then beyond, it's always been the dedication of the community that has helped. What do we need in the community for healthcare services to help it grow and develop? And recently, I was just asked because um, you may know our current hospital president and CEO is retiring at the end of the year. And someone said, has there ever been a woman hospital president? I'm like, well, yeah, absolutely. Not only did that first hospital association consist of all the 17 women, the first administrator of that 1915 hospital was named Miss Della Darling, which kind of sounds like it's out of a movie, but it said that Miss Darling was the ho hospital administrator in 1915. In 1917, she left to go to France to be a war nurse. So um, she was her her successor was also a female. The 1935 hospital had a woman administrator, and actually there was a female administrator up until 1965. And also very many women involved in the board over the years, because that first board of three trustees was um, uh, not only, or two Bens, Ben Abbott and Ben Shine, but we had Wilma Hurd and then Marnie Larson for many, many years was on the board. And currently our board president is Julie Christensen, who joined us tonight, so thanks, Julie. So in the 50s, um, you know, Spencer had grown a lot and also a lot of healthcare services had been developed. So there was a need for an addition. So a two-story was addition, uh, addition with 45 beds was constructed and opened in 53. And I'm sure someone will tell me which street that now faces, what entrance that was, what direction? Yes, East 11th Street. So, and that 53 building is still there today. And you can kind of see, you see down in this picture, you still see the original 35 hospital, and here's the 53 edition. In the 60s, there was another wing added, and actually a couple wings, and in 75, another edition was built. So here we go, and this is not a great photo, but I pulled it off of a copy of a newspaper online. So here's the 53. Here's probably what was added in 65, early 70s. And here's that 35 building, which is still, which faced west. Also during the um, 70s, uh, Spencer Hospital acquired the ambulance services too. So later in 70, there was another wing built. So there was so much construction, the contractors must have just been living at the hospital. This is where, as you look at it, this west wing was built. So the 35 building was taken down and the west wing was added. Now, I've seen it. There's still a small portion of foundation in the basement of the hospital. Adam's shaking his head yes. He's seen it too. So in the 80s, the focus was not as much on developing infrastructure, but on developing services. So Spencer Hospital was really one of the first 
hospitals in Northwest Iowa to develop hospice services. And when hospice services were developed initially, there was not reimbursement from Medicare and insurances. And so there was a ton of community fundraising that went on to support hospice and very grateful for that. Also during the 80s, um, inpatient behavioral health services were added and we still have an inpatient behavioral health wing today. And um, the hospital got very involved in providing educational opportunities in the region and still do that today. Now this top picture, that is actually Ben Shine, and it's a picture of him testing out a dictaphone system. Ben Shine, as I mentioned, was one of our long-term time trustees along with Ben Abin, and they did, um, can be credited for a lot of the growth and development of the hospital over the years. So he and his wife in the 80s gave an endowment of $50,000 to start a scholarship fund. And every year, Shine scholarships are still given. They were recently looked at um, just a few weeks ago and probably will be announced soon, too. And then also another educational fund I want to mention is that earlier in the 60s, the Cornwall family um, developed the Cornwall Educational Loan Program, and they named that in honor of Ruth Cornwall. These are to help local students interested in health care to get a little help with their education and tuition. So then we get into the late 80s, early 90s. In the very late 80s, in 89, construction started on the north side of the hospital to build a third floor. That third floor um, became the new birth center at that time. There's one since then. That birth center changed kind of the model of um, how deliveries were done. Before, I know I talked to some people who were born at Spencer Hospital. There was a time when the women who were in labor were all together in one ward. Then you were whisked away to the delivery room, had your baby, then taken back, and you were more in a ward for post, you know, postpartum and recovery, as they say. These, um, the 91 birth center featured what they call LDPR rooms, labor, delivery, postpartum, recovery, all in one room. They're beautiful. They've got places for dads to stay and all that. And then there was a little area next to that that was kind of shelled out that later became administrative um, offices in the 90s. Also in the early 1990s, in 1993, the Spencer Regional Healthcare Foundation was incorporated. The fa fundraising and community support had been a huge part of the hospital history its entirety. That's real, because of people who cared, that's why Spencer Hospital was created and grew and developed over the years. The foundation just provided a formal way to um, help take in those donor dollars and help match the donor's wishes to enhance services. And so, um, big announcement that the foundation was, incor uh, was incorporated and started, and then, um, then they hired their first foundation director in 94. And that's actually me. So um, I was editor to the paper then, and so they wanted someone to help run the foundation and also um, do some marketing and communication and public relation. So the rest part of the hospital history, which is the next 25% of that 109 year history, I had a front row seat to it. Um, but back to the foundation. The first major project of the foundation was actually underway when I started in um, June of 94. And that was the Milton and Ethel Warner Dialysis Center. That birth center that had been on the third floor of the 53 building where they had the, the labor rooms, the delivery rooms and all that, they took a portion of it and um, uh, constructed it into our first dialysis center. Now, Milt Warner had been very instrumental in supporting the hospital and other community activities over many years. He'd helped fundraise for the hospital, and personally, he didn't have anyone in his family impacted and in need of dialysis services, but he had helped driven several friends to dialysis care. And if anyone has um, known someone who needs dialysis, it is a commitment of three days a week, you go in, and it's your day. So if you imagine the travel on top of it and maybe not always feeling your best, you know, it was identified by the com community and the hospital and Milt Warner as being an important service to add. So they gave a very generous gift to get that started. And um, that opened in 94. And then in, as the need for services grew and we were seeing a lot of people come from Northern Iowa 
a satellite center was built. It started in, 20, in 2001, opened in uh, 2002 in Spirit Lake. And then, as you all know, um, in just a few years ago, in 2018, we moved from the third floor of the hospital out to West 18th Street. Also in the 90s, so in 1994, when um, the dialysis center was being built, the medical office building was built on the north side of the hospital. This groundbreaking ceremony actually took place, I think, the week after I started at the hospital. And it was to have um, three physician offices in it. Two of those offices are still there, Northwest Iowa Bone and Northwest Iowa Urology. And then Spencer Psychiatry was initially in that building. And then Wolf Eye Care Center was in that spot. Wolf Eye Care Center has recently moved. And there are plans and a lot of people with a lot of ideas for the space that's there now. Then the next major pro project of the foundation, and we talked about people traveling for services, was Avon Cancer Center. Spencer Hospital provided medical oncology, which is chemotherapy, and um, doesn't require a lot of equipment to do for many, many years. But anyone in Northwest Iowa that needed radiation therapy needed to travel, you know, really Sioux Falls, Sioux City, Mason City, to get radiation care. Radiation therapy is typically delivered five days a week. You're in and out of there, typically in 15 or 20 minutes, but if you had to drive four hours on top of that, it was really daunting for people in their care. So fortunately, Spencer Hospital got the green light to build a radiation treatment center. So the top picture on the right is the groundbreaking for that. This is the picture of how the center looked when it was open. Initially, you may notice, and I know it's hard in this lighting, it was the Northwest Iowa Cancer Treatment Center. The Board of Trustees voted to name it after Ben and Tina Abin, because not only had the Abins been very generous over the years and supportive of the hospital, Tina Abin was still living in 1995 when we started the fund drive for the Cancer Center, and she gave the first gift. And Ben had been a longtime trustee and had done a lot for the hospital as well, so it was named after the Abin family. So then, and now, and I just wanna, this is a little commercial in the middle of my presentation. Um, the equipment for the Radiation Treatment Center has you know, been updated frequently to remain state of the art. This is our new radiation oncologist, Dr. Wen, just started with us last September. He's an amazing man, has an, uh, his own amazing story. And he is presenting a program at Occasions, at, which is the Spencer Activity Center, on May 24th. And if you're going for lunch, I think you need to call ahead, make reservations, but he's fascinating. He and many of his family members escaped from Saigon during the fall of Saigon. So back to, that was the 90s, now we're into 2000. And I know I'm going through the decades, hopefully quickly enough. So in 2005, that's when we added the surgery center on the um, west side of the hospital. And as we were working on the surgery center, ground broke in 2003, but in the planning, you know, it's kind of like, like at your home. You, you up, update your kitchen, but you know you need to paint your living room, but everything has to take its turn. It's like, what is the next big project? Well, we knew that we needed to update our inpatient rooms because they were great in the 60s and 70s. However, as we reached the 2000s, um, our rooms were double occupancy and most patients were not as preferred having a private room. And so, the two floors were shelled on top of the surgery center for future growth. So the surgery center opened in May of 2005 and pretty much right away that future growth started happening. So I went to work on developing those inpatient wings, those two floors, and in um, December of 07, they were open. In the 2010 decade, we renovated ICU, same footprint on second floor. Um, added surgical robotics, first in the Northwest Iowa to do so. Um, and then the first center was built next to the surgery center, so a little bit further west, um, and opened in 2016. And this was done, that birth center built in 91, was great, it was beautiful. However, even though we could turn the elevator key off and get a straight shot down to surgery, there's something that they call in the OB practices, decision to incision if you need an emergency C-section. And so this way we are right next to the surgery center, seconds that decision's made, you're in there and able to have surgery if needed. 
Also in the 2010 decade, Spencer Dialysis was relocated, as I mentioned earlier, moved in 2018. Um, in that space that was vacated by dialysis, it was perfect for the infusion center. Not We were already doing infusion services, but this grouped them all together. Um, the hospice services began, and then many partnerships have been occurred between the hospital and our medical practices as well. So far in the 2020s, you know, you think we're just into 23, there can't be a lot, but there's been a few things. So we've added orthopedic robotics, and then right in 2020, we added um, two hyperbaric um, oxygen chambers for wound care treatment. And so those are on third floor and actually in the former birth center area. That was um, that 1991 birth center area. And in August, we opened Hartley Family Care. So that takes us up a little bit to Spencer Hospital today. Um, we are a municipal hospital, so we do an annual report. Our fiscal year is from July 1st through June 20, June 30th. And so this is our 22, um, just some stats, and you probably received one of these in the mail. Um, I will point out that at the beginning of the fiscal year, end of the fiscal year, we're at 504 employees. Those are employed staff members. We also have contract workers as well. And, you know, healthcare across the country has been struggling with numbers a little bit. So um, we're fortunately seeing a recovery. We're probably up to about 540 now of uh, employees. And with our contract and um, some of those our permanent contract workers were at 580 that work between the hospital and like the Milford Sioux Rapids and the different clinics as well. We have, four, we're located in four counties, so naturally we're in Clay County, but as I mentioned, we have three rural clinics. We have uh, Sioux Rapids in, o in BV, and then we have Milford Family Care, plus we have Spirit Lake Dialysis, both in Dickinson County, and we're in O'Brien with Hartley Family Care. Now what you've really been wanting to get to is Spencer Hospital of tomorrow. And um, thanks to CNBA, we have these wonderful conceptuals. So at the very bottom of the screen, the white here that I'm shining on, that is Grand Avenue. So here is 12th Street, which comes to the front of the hospital. We have the Cancer Center, the Medical Office Building, and then the Birth Center, and the Surgery Center. This is that medical surgical area. Clear in the back is where the emergency department now is, you know, intensive care, behavioral health. This is the 53 building. Here is where the new emergency department will sit. It is right next to the medical office building. And you can see that a little bit more from this map too. And then this conceptual is you're on 11th Street, you're walking straight down to the emergency room. And so that's a little bit, you know, and again, I just want to um, uh, reiterate that even though I touched a lot on building and expansion projects and different services, behind it all, it's really been the people that have made the difference. You know, it's our staff. They're amazing. They're dedicated. They're committed. They're professional. It's our trustees and our leadership that have vision to make things happen. And it's the community that's really supported the hospital over the years. So I want to thank each of you for your role in doing that. So. I know some of you may know more about Spencer Hospital than I do, so if anything has it, anyone has anything to add or any questions, just let me know. Thank you. That is a good question. Um, we tend to talk in seasons when things are gonna be done. Right now, we're still seeing most likely the very end of 24, but it could be into 2025 before that's done. So that street will be closed then? That yeah, actually, and if you, let's go back to that picture. As you'll see, 11th Street does not go completely through because it, you will come off of Grand Avenue and you'll be able to come down, pull up to the emergency room and drop off and park. 11th Street, you, it, it's no longer a thorough street that has been vacated by the city and now is part of the Spencer Hospital property. Now, those buildings are not adjoining. That was talked about, but we learned that that was going to be probably an, 
a very expensive proposition to do because there are some not only utilities that run through here but to connect that medical office building it would have to be brought up to hospital grade which is all kinds of different codes adam shaking his head yes and so there's a canopy there and there will be um, quick walkways but this is so i mean we have so many patients and so many personnel that are back and forth on the street all day long that that's going to be wonderful to be able to just take a wheelchair out and not go outside in the elements so will there be a skywalk at least between the two um it's not a skywalk but you you roll right out of um the medical arts building right into the emergency building it's not that far it's not, I don't, yeah, it's not elevated and you go from the canopy and there's a few feet right right it and so yes yeah, since i you know, i don't think i have a good picture of that one maybe 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 not so this is that'll be the new entrance to the emergency room so there will be a door and this is right outside that's like right outside the clinic so you walk in there and there is a passageway around and so you'll be able to enter the hospital right from the clinic really easily yeah the ambulance entrance is actually on the back side so that's really nice so and they have a two bay garage here and they were adding an ancillary garage over actually where our ambulance garage was they are replacing that and that is getting closer to being done um, hope to really move further along but winter hit hit earlier than we wanted it to last fall Oh, Season Center. Season Center is, yep, so um, see, let's see if I can see maybe back on, you don't really see it, but back on, this Season Center is right back here, and they're actually under renovation right now themselves, and so they've temporarily moved out while they're doing some renovation, but yep, they'll be right there. That intersection is actually, will be open, so um, for traffic so um second avenue and um levens east 11th street are open yeah, mayor the, the stays exactly where it, is, it does um adam you can jump in there's no plan at this time to move the helipad um super challenging with federal aviation um, regulations and so there is a path it's timed out a direct path that goes out sort of on the back side of this edition and gives a straight shot to the, uh, to the helipad um, but yeah like you said there's a lot of regulations and a lot of requirements that if we were to relocate that that, that get pretty expensive and so mm -hmm. uh, the question but it's uh, probably something down the way so. <laughs> In, yeah. uh, last year, we did a deal on uh, inventors with Spencer addresses, inventors that had patents. And uh, I know a lot of you came to hear John and Jeff Thomas do the deal on Walt Thomas, and we talked about other inventions. But thanks to Dave Schaefer, he got me a list of all of the inventors in Spencer. And in 1890, and I'm going to be a year or two off, but in 1898, Dr. E. E. Munger had got a patent for, uh, and the reason I bring it up is that we saw his picture, uh, a patent for a hospital bed. And then in like 1901, he got a second uh, patent on another hospital bed, which I assume was an adjustable because they said a raised hospital bed. And then in 1960, he got a patent for uh, a telephone answering machine. Well, I don't remember. Does anybody remember a telephone answering machine in 1960? <laughs> you know, I found that patent. I didn't find the other ones, but when I was looking for Dr. Munger, I found E.E. E. Patton. So I wasn't sure if it was him or if it was his son. son but I had forgotten that, because I knew Dr. Munger Jr., but I'd forgotten he was a junior. Yeah. He was a junior, yeah. You know, I was doing the math, I said, good grief, this guy, I mean, he had to be, you know, probably 30 when they started this thing at minimum with med school and everything else and i'm thinking how on earth was he still getting patents 
He had to be 90 years old when he was getting married. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was amazed because, um, you know, I, I know I got my first answering machine in the, sometime in the 90s, and I think they were all new then. So he had a patent back in the 60s for a tel uh, machine that would answer and record a message from a telephone. So gentleman right here in Spencer. So it's amazing the number of inventors we have from this region. Currently, yes. If there's, a, if you have an emergency now, the emergency center is still open. And mm -hmm. you know, somebody told me years ago that their mother had a baby at the first hospital a cop breast of, of the Temple Triad. Is that true? That building, that big white two-story building, had a longer man. Yes. Yep. That is that is our first Spencer Hospital. It's the one right behind and on third. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. You guys, you're all part of history. <laughs> no, that's so interesting. So when they took out all these houses, mm -hmm. just took them out. Is that just a green spot? No, that is going to be, that's going to be parking additional parking you know particularly for our surgeons that they love that back entrance into the surgery center so well thanks for the opportunity i don't know if there's anyone else to questions or <laughs> yeah thank you susan um yeah, so that's uh, that's the show that we have for tonight. Um, we have these lecture series throughout the rest of the month of May. So um, I think there is some flyers. I'm not sure where the pile is. I think it's in the back corner on the chair over there. Uh, if you didn't get one, be sure to grab one of those.